In video 38 uh, of the Foundations uh, of Computational Economics course, uh, we will look at, uh, finally, look at dynamic programming with continuous choice. So what do I mean by that? Well, the goal here will be to take continuous choice seriously. Uh, and by that I mean that we will not be discretizing the choice variables, or the choice state. So, um, no discretization. Instead, we will employ uh, a numerical optimizer to find the optimal uh, continuous choice in Bellman equation. So we will solve the maximization problem in Bellman equation directly and numerically. Um, the thing is that, uh, you know, as before, before we could vectorize the solution of the Bellman equation, and uh, we could express the maximands in the Bellman as a matrix, so maybe three-dimensional array, uh, like in the stochastic consumption savings problem, uh, and then take a maximum along one of the axes. Uh, so we vectorize the problem. Now this is not possible, and now we have to be uh, solving this um, uh, optimal choice uh, in every point in the state space. And already this realization makes us think that this is going to be slow, or slower at least. All right, so um, we will uh, eventually e expand the, uh, uh, the Deaton's model uh, or the class that implements the Deaton's model uh, with, this, with this new solver. Uh, so uh, let's uh, just go through it really quick. Here's the Bellman equation for the Deaton's model. Uh, and in light of the previous video, you can see that since I have not written time indices here, so I'm thinking about the Deaton's model in the infinite horizon, but of course we could also formulate it in the finite horizon uh, as uh, in the uh, recent exercise. Uh, but for here we have uh, infinite time, uh, infinite horizon, discrete time, uh, continuous choice of consumption. Here's our continuous choice, right, which uh, which is bounded. And the state space is given only by one variable, which is the beginning of the period, uh, consumable resources. As before, we assume that income is uh, random uh, and follows a log normal distribution with fixed parameter uh, uh, mu and sigma, and sigma which is not fixed, uh, and the returns are not stochastic. It could be the other way around, or we could have both of them stochastic, actually. Uh, and uh, then the derivations uh, uh, would change a little bit, uh, but not drastically. I'm sure many of you will be able to uh, expand this, uh, uh, the propositions to, to the case of uh, both of these elements being stochastic. Uh, all right, uh, finally, the preferences are given by the simple utility function, which is still log. It doesn't really matter what the utility function is so far. Um, we can easily change it, uh, um, of course, while keeping it reasonable. Uh, now, the discount factor is beta, and as I said, the returns on savings is fixed, and it's equals to R. Uh, all right. Um, so, um, if we want to treat the choice uh, variable as truly continuous, then we basically have to compute this, uh, uh, the solution to this maximization problem here. So we're maximizing some function uh, of C, and M here, which enters uh, here, and which enters in as, a, as a constraint, uh, this M is a parameter, essentially. Right, so we have, in fact, a constraint uh, bounded uh, optimization problem. Uh, we have to solve it for all possible values of M, so for all parameters, as I mentioned before. And uh, when, we, uh, when we evaluate this function G, so uh, when we employ some optimization routine like Newton method, for example, uh, we have to evaluate this G many times, and every time we evaluate this G, well, we will have to calculate V at uh, various different points uh, in between the grid uh, uh, in particular. So we will have to uh, interpolate the value function every time we evaluate the objective. And of course, we also have to calculate the expectation as this is part of the, uh, uh, of the objective function that we, are, uh, that we are dealing with here. All right, so in order to do all of that, let's, let, let's go very quickly 
uh, uh, through uh, the optimization routines that are available in Python. And so here I'm not going to go into the details of various optimization methods. This is a big uh, topic in computer science and uh, and there is many different approaches uh, available. But I will give a, a, a sort of a general overview uh, and uh, give links to the relevant resources. So uh, first thing to realize is that every optimization problem can be approached directly as a, an optimization problem. Um, or it can be approached through the lens of the for analytic, hopefully, first order conditions. Uh, well, assuming that the function is differentiable here, of course. Uh, and so the first order condition approach is essentially an equation solving problem. And we've looked at that before uh, when we talked about bisections, uh, Newton method, um, what else, successive approximations in video 22, and the uh, Newton with bounds in video 23. Um, so here we will uh, review the optimization uh, uh, routines, so numerical optimization methods. But bear in mind that, that the two approaches are pretty much equivalent in terms of computational complexity and often uh, actually result in, in completely identical formulas. Like for example, uh, our Newton method, which we used to, uh, to solve the first order conditions for this maximization problem here, and this is the example problem which we looked at uh, back in video 22. You know, we can write the first order condition by differentiating and we can find these three roots of, of this, um, I'm sorry, of this third degree polynomial. So three uh, uh, critical points for, for this fourth degree polynomial. Um, and the way we've uh, uh, we wave, the way we've motivated the Newton method is before is uh, through Taylor series expansion where we applied it to the uh, first order condition. Okay, so if g, uh, I'm sorry, if the f prime equals zero is the condition, we can say that g function is uh, uh, is the derivative of the function of interest f, and then we apply. Um, uh, the Taylor expansion to the g function, and here x prime just denotes some other point x, uh, which I want these the first order conditions to hold at here. So I can write the Taylor expansion, and then uh, because it needs to be equal zero due to the first order condition, we can rearrange and find that you know to move towards this point, uh, which should be a solution, we have to perform this step. Uh, from any particular, any any previous arbitrary value x. Um, and of course this rewrites if we replace g by f, g is an f prime and so g prime is f double prime. So this now becomes the formula for the Newton step in the optimization problem of f. Well, uh, equivalently we could say that, uh, imagine that we are at some point xi at iteration i. And we want to approximate the function of interest f of x with the uh, uh, with a second degree polynomial with a quadratic function, also using Taylor series uh, to build this approximation. So we will now look at three uh, first terms in the Taylor series, and uh, for you know have this approximating function f uh, with a hat, and then uh, the step is to basically minimize this uh, approximation or maximize. So we can take the first order condition of this function, of the approximating function, and again uh, equalize that to zero and rearrange and get exactly the same formula for the Newton step. So what I want to say is that you know when we're solving the first order conditions in the optimization problem with Newton method, uh, that's uh, we're doing the same work that needs to be done to apply Newton method for the maximization or minimization problem. And um, here is a little illustration. Uh, this code is our um, uh, uh, well-recognizable Newton solver. And uh, here are the functions that we had on the slides with the derivatives denoted small f and, and g being the second derivative or the der derivative of the first order condition equation. Um, uh, and uh, uh, here are some plotting functions uh, which uh, we will see in a second. 
So I want to illustrate uh, how this uh, Newton uh, um, uh, solver works. And here on the left, I'm going to draw the derivative of the function of interest, so the first order condition uh, in red, while on the right, uh, I'm drawing in red the uh, uh, function that we want to optimize, okay? Minimize or, or, or maximize. Well, so uh, as you can see, if we start from the same point somewhere in, well, minus 1.3 uh, here and there, you know, taking the Newton step in terms of solving the equation is exactly the equivalent to, uh, um, uh, to maximizing the quadratic approximation built at this point. And this, this holds as we go through the iterations of the Newton step, you know, the next uh, x is going to be here uh, and or here, which is the same point as we saw the formulas are the same. And then we continue with the, with the step and we converge to the solution of the equation here and the critical point here. Uh, and so all of the all, all, all other um, reservations and drawbacks of the Newton method, method uh, apply here just as well, right? So we know that it doesn't always converge and in, it, it may uh, cycle or it may get out of uh, uh, domain of, uh, of the function. Uh, and sometimes it just doesn't converge if it's not in the region of attraction. So, um, uh, and it's also very, um, uh, um, very um, sensitive to the uh, to the starting value to the starting point. So I started in a in a different uh, point, and it converges to the uh, uh, to a different uh, a critical point in a different solution of the first order condition, and then of course we can find a starting value where it would just converge to the to this middle point. And so a local minimum of the function of interest. But you can see here that, uh, you know, solving the first order condition with Newton method is exactly the same as a, applying a quadratic approximation to the, uh, to the function of interest and minimizing that approximation. Although, you know, s here in the first steps, this quadratic approximation makes very little sense. Okay, so uh, of course the same machinery of Newton uh, method uh, or Newton uh, uh, can be applied in the multidimensional case, uh, uh, and we've looked at that too. And here I just want to uh, sort of remind you of the of the uh, um, of the um, terms, so that when we discuss the further methods. We are on the same page. So if Newton is used as an optimization method, so maximization or minimization, then we have this f function of interest, and uh, there is gradient of f, which is a vector, right? Because we have to differentiate f with respect to all of uh, uh, many, uh, many variables. This is a multivariate function. And then we also have the Hessian matrix, which is the matrix of uh, second order partial derivatives of f. Right, so the, the matrix of second order derivative is a Hessian matrix. Uh, on the other hand, if we solve the same problem using the first order condition, then we would talk about the uh, vector valued uh, multivariate function G, which represents the gradient, uh, the derivatives of function F, but it returns the vector of values, right? Because it returns the derivative with respect to each of the, of the uh, um, variables. And it is still a multivariate function as well because it needs all of the variables as, an as inputs. And then uh, if we differentiate G, then what we get is a Jacobian matrix of the first order partial derivatives of the uh, vector valued function G. Uh, so in that sense, when we are solving the optimization problem, then the Hessian matrix of second order derivatives and the Jacobian matrix of the first order derivatives is sort of an equivalent thing because they uh, represent the same, the same objects. Okay, so uh, in multivariate uh, case, this, the Newton step becomes, uh, um, uh, has the same form, but now in matrix, uh, 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 in matrix in matrix arithmetics, it requires the inversion of the Hessian uh, uh, of the Hessian matrix, and um, that could be uh, computationally uh, more challenging. Um, uh, and you know, in very large applications, that could be a limiting factor for the application of Newton. 
Moreover, if the analytical hashing in Jacobian are not available, then what could you do to to apply still apply Newton? You need this you need the subject right to compute the Newton step, and so numerical differentiation is one of the possible venues where the uh, um, the derivative is approximated by uh, the fraction of uh, of the you know change in the function value divided by the change in the argument. But uh, with many variables, uh, it might it might be uh, um, a slow process to compute those numerical variables, especially numerical Hessians when we need uh, um, second order derivatives. And so this the, this this can be a real uh, a limiting a re real limiting factor for the application of Newton. Okay, uh, to to deal with that, at least to some extent, there is a whole collection of methods which are called quasi-Newton methods, and many of them are uh, uh, available through SciPy Optimize uh, module. Uh, with the main idea being is that we can replace the Hessian uh, matrix with an approximation, and the approximation can take in various sort of information, like for example the uh, um, the approximation of the Hessian on the previous step of the of the iterative algorithm on the previous iteration, or the value function, uh, uh, or the fun the values of the function, and uh, there are different schemes to approximate Hessian uh, for the purpose of the quasi Newton method. So quasi here means that the Hessian is not uh, computed exactly. Right, and there's a whole bunch of, of different methods, with BFGS being a so, uh, popular and a powerful modern uh, numerical optimization method. Now, the BHHH is a really, really in interesting um, uh, uh, um, approach here, and uh, it is usually not part of the standard packages, uh, uh, like Sky op uh, SciPy Optimize, for example. And the reason is that it has very specific uh, area of application. It's applicable for um, for estimation and statistical applications. Here, the approximation of the Hessian is given by the outer product of the gradients uh, uh, computed at different uh, data points. Okay, and then the approximation works because of the statistical properties, uh, uh, namely the information equality. Uh, and therefore, it's not a, a general uh, it's not a general approach, but it works really, really well in the uh, uh, statistical applications. And we will talk more about BHH uh, towards the end of the course when we talk about estimation. Now, if we take a broader view at the uh, at all optimization methods that are available, then we should uh, uh, talk about the following classes. Uh, there are line search methods, uh, and the idea here is that uh, the method, uh, you know, it, it's an iterative method which finds itself somewhere uh, in the point, then makes a step, and then another point and makes a step, and this is uh, hopefully towards the, you know, the maximum of the function. So if these are the, uh, the level curves of the function, then we're going towards the maximum or the minimum. Um, so Newton, Newton and quasi-Newton are examples of this uh, of this line search methods because, as I already mentioned, the Newton step really defines the direction of the uh, uh, of the step if we are thinking about the multivariate problems. Uh, there is a gradient descent, which is uh, uh, which we'll look at it, uh, just in a second, which is also um, uh, a member of this of this class of problems. Now, trust region methods. Uh, the idea there is that uh, at each, it's also an iteration, at each uh, uh, point, iterative point x, we can have an area uh, around it that, um, uh, where the, the function is approximated well enough with some approximating uh, sort of simpler function. And then we can make a step uh, uh, um, uh, towards the new in the new points on X, where we would have some uh, degree of certainty uh, or uh, about the accuracy of the approximation in that area, uh, and so instead of um, instead of choosing the direction first and then making a step in that direction, the trust region method keeps track of how well the function of interest is approximated. Uh, um, uh, on for for sort of in all possible direction or in 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 all directions around a point. 
Um, now, there are uh, uh, derivative-free algorithms, of course. And these, uh, these are the algorithms that uh, um, optimize, the, they find a maximum and minimum of a function without requiring the derivatives, any derivatives, even the first derivatives not required. And uh, these methods are uh, useful uh, in many applications uh, um, where calculating the derivative is just really, uh, really complicated. It's slow or it's the problem is really... Uh, um, uh, you know, not uh, not an, um, doesn't have any clear um, functional form, right? So the most common here is the Nelder meets, or sometimes called the simplex method, where uh, um, uh, w which can be uh, which can be visualized by these flipping triangles. Or it could be a pattern search, which is simply a generalization of the grid search uh, for multiple dimensions. Now, the global solution algorithms are um, uh, uh, aiming at finding the global optima of the function in some uh, given set. Uh, and this is a very hard problem and very hard task. Uh, you know, all the methods that we've mentioned so far are good at finding, uh, or are capable rather, of finding a local optima where, the, say, the first-order conditions are satisfied, but uh, even then, you need second-order conditions to to find out whether it's a minimum or a maximum, and uh, uh, pretty much you don't have any uh, idea of whether that's a global optimum or not. Now, simulation-based algorithms, or things like genetic algorithms, they uh, uh, allow to uh, search for the global maximum uh, uh, over a particular set, but these algorithms are really slow. Uh, and so it shouldn't be used, uh, really, if, if the uh, simpler algorithms can be used. And then poly algorithms, of course, uh, as I've mentioned several times in this course before, uh, is a very good idea of combining um, uh, uh, advantages from different approaches in order to uh, have an algorithm that can start uh, maybe far away from the solution and then uh, you know, make several robust steps towards the solution, then switch to uh, a faster algorithm like a Newton algorithm to converge f really fast to the solution, fast uh, and uh, uh, get, get accuracy in, in a small number of uh, iterations. Uh, all right, um, just to uh, uh, distinct... Um, global convergence and global optima, because these uh, uh, notions are often um, uh, mixed up. Um, think of a Newton step uh, and a Newton method. You know, this S here, as I've mentioned, defines the direction of the step, uh, and this is the direction towards which we uh, take a step of, of length one uh, to get the next uh, xi. And, you know, then we calculate this SI again uh, there and take another step and another step. Uh, now, uh, uh, Newton method is not globally convergent. So it could be that it diverges from some points, so it cycles in some points, when started at some points. Uh, but it's not uh, impossible to make it globally convergent by uh, including this tau, which is the step size. The step size tau... Uh, allows uh, um, uh, Newton to become a globally convergent method. Uh, uh, well, there's an additional work, right? So after finding the direction, you know, by inverting the Hessian and multiplying it with the uh, uh, with the gradient, then we can uh, uh, also separately search for the good value of tau to allow Newton method to actually make that step. Um, and tau is uh, uh, can be less than one, so the the method becomes not as fast, but uh, it becomes more robust in terms of convergence. And even so, if uh, you know we attain this global global convergence, uh, it is a global convergent to the local optimum. So global optima, you know the uh, the the highest peak uh, in the surface if we are maximizing a function. Uh, finding the highest peak is the uh, is the task for this global methods, uh, and global convergence means that we can start the method anywhere, uh, and and it will converge to some solution. The solution will be local, but there will be convergence. 
Of course, in some special cases, like in with contraction mappings, for example, uh, these are the problems which are uh, um, we, which, which only have one solution, right? So global convergence means that we are converging to this one single solution, like uh, like in in the successive uh, approximation methods. Um, as VFI, for example, right? So if we know that we're dealing um, with a problem when we have to find the fixed point of uh, contraction mapping, then global convergence means that the problem will definitely be solved. If we talk about the gradient descent method, this is uh, an example of the line search algorithm where the direction is given by the gradient of the function. And the gradient, of course, is the direction, uh, or the gradient gives the direction in which uh, the function changes the, with the fastest rate. And so it is a, a greedy algorithm. It goes to the maximum by taking the steepest hill to climb. And then, uh, you know, the step size is, uh, becomes really important. Uh, and finding the step size is a separate one-dimensional optimization subproblem. Uh, because without the step size, you know, the gradient descent may end up uh, in the very wrong uh, points. Um, and yet, uh, uh, you know, being greedy is uh, uh, not always and most likely or more often it's, it's a bad strategy. Um, taking the steepest climb uh, may end up in this, you know, lead to the situations uh, where um, uh, some fast improvements of the uh, of the function may uh, follow with uh, many iterations of very slow improvements, uh, whereas Newton method would take uh, uh, these, the 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 approximating axis, uh, the axis uh, closer to the uh, uh, peak right away. Okay, talking about the derivative free methods, I should say these are the methods of last resort. So only if it is really hard to compute uh, um, the derivatives that we should use them. Grid search is uh, the method that we looked at. Uh, the, these methods might be good as a first stage of the poly algorithm, as we've uh, um, uh, talked before. So in SciPy, there is a method brute which uh, which implements grid search. You don't have to do it yourself every time. Nelder Mead, the simplex method, as I've already mentioned, the pattern search, the generalization of grid search to multiple dimensions. And sometimes there are model-specific uh, solvers which do not require derivative-free methods. And uh, by model-specific, I mean that some structure of the model is taken into account when uh, solving for the uh, uh, solving uh, for for some optimal decisions or, uh, or or maximizing certain functions, and an example is, for example, Pounders, uh, which is the derivative-free solution uh, uh, algorithm to minimize the sum of squares. So, just the structure of this minimization of the sum of squares allows Pounders to use this additional information to be an efficient derivative-free. Uh, 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 solver. Okay, uh, with Nelder Mead, since it is a very commonly, uh, very, very common uh, derivative free method, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about it. Um, so it works with simplexes uh, or triangles uh, uh, in, in the plane. So we uh, have to initialize the problem with some initial simplex, and then uh, the simplex uh, is updated based on the function values, and there are three things that can happen. Uh, it can increase in size, it can reduce size, so it can flip to get into some new region uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the space uh, of variables. And, and these steps are repeated until convergence, until the change in the, uh, in the function value becomes very small. Now, uh, the experience is that this method is really, really slow. Uh, I mean, if you're dealing with a computationally hard problem, like the estimation problems we will talk about later in the course, or in the very end of the course, then uh, Nelder Mead essentially takes forever to converge, whereas uh, more efficient uh, algorithms, um, uh, you know, provide some uh, um, more re provide more realistic running times. They're not immediate, but if each computation of the uh, of the uh, objective function takes a lot of time, then making a lot of extra steps is really really costly. 
So here's a visualization of the Nelder Mead, uh, which, uh, which um, let's see, was probably initialized here, and then there was a flip of this triangle, so the three points that it keeps track of uh, here and there, and then another one, another one, and so you can see how it converges to the top of this function, and then the triangle shrink, 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 and then the uh, converges and stops. But the number of... Uh, of function evaluations in this process is a lot, a lot more than what would be needed uh, uh, for a Newton method or even a quasi-Newton method. Okay, now uh, um, with derivative-free method, there is uh, there is a trade-off uh, that um, um, they can only provide local convergence. Uh, uh, th this this should be this should be kept in mind that anybody talking about the global convergence with these derivative methods is either assuming something about the problem, like uh, Pounders does, for example, because it assumes right that we are minimizing the sum of squares. Always prepared to wait forever. Uh, here is the quote from the uh, from the well-known book on global optimization by Torn and Zilinskas. Uh, Zilinskas. Yeah. Um, but global methods are available, and um, um, even though the uh, uh, the, the same uh, caution should be taken when using this global uh, with this method, uh, we have simulated annealing uh, or particle swarms, so evolutionary algorithms, all of which uh, aim at finding the actual global optimum of the function on a given set. Um, so in SciPy there are uh, routines available like basin hopping or, or dual annealing, uh, which implement these methods. But again, in uh, most of economic applications, uh, you know, it's a very good idea to start first with a simpler solution methods and then maybe think of a of a poly algorithm, like uh, do a multi start. Uh, um, you know, by doing some uh, uh, rough grid search and then try to apply to, uh, try to apply uh, derivative-based methods. All right. So uh, to finish off this uh, uh, short exposition of the of the available methods, let's mention also constraint optimization, uh, which has many applications in econometrics. Uh, uh, for example, uh, there are constraint constraint optimization means that we are optimizing uh, uh, some function subject to constraints on the variables uh, on the in the problem. So like uh, for example, in linear programming, we had constraints uh, in the problems. But of course, if the objective is linear, then the optimization is uh, not hard at all, uh, or much easy, much 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 less hard than optimization of the nonlinear functions. Uh, there is a collection of constraint optimization methods which are also available in, in uh, SciPy. Okay, let's look at a particular uh, implementation uh, of this uh, Bellman equation with, uh, with continuous choices. Uh, and we'll go back to the, uh, uh, to the optimal um, uh, consumption with cake eating, right? And now I can say that cake eating problem is just uh, a consumption savings problem when we don't have any returns on savings, there is no income, uh, and so the next period uh, resources are simply given by the uh, formula here. The, the size of the cake available to us tomorrow is just what has not been eaten today. Um, the Bellman equation, uh, uh, you, you probably already all remember by now, for the cake eating problem. Uh, and so the goal is to numerically solve this maximization problem here for every point of M. Okay, so what sort of numerical optimization method should we use here? Um, first of all, can we use Newton? Newton should be checked uh, f first of all. So if we want to use Newton to uh, find the maximum of this function, then we will need the derivative and the second derivative of this function. But you can see that here, we, this, this uh, value function v depends on c, so we will need the derivative and the second derivative of the, of the value function. Well, unfortunately, value function is only available to us on a grid, right? So even the first derivative uh, is, uh, is hard to compute. It's going to be very inaccurate if we uh, uh, say, um, 
use linear uh, interpolation, then it's just going to be, a, a, you know, a discontinued. The derivative will be discontinuous piecewise flat function. But even if we use more elaborate uh, interpolation schemes, the uh, derivative of those interpolation functions may be very far off from the derivative of the value function itself. Okay, so Newton is probably not applicable, at least directly, uh, without a special uh, code or special measures taken to approximate the derivative and the second derivative of the value function itself. Uh, but the problem is bounded, right? So uh, th there, there are these clear bounds on the choice variable, and so even something like bisections uh, to solve the first order conditions could do well. Again, we don't have derivative. Um, what about uh, Nelder Mead um, uh, or other derivative free methods? Quasi Newton method with bounds. Well, for all of these, we will have to uh, uh, probably numerically approximate the derivative of the value function, which, uh, which might not uh, uh, be uh, fast or accurate. So, in any case, this, this becomes a quite good example when it's kind of hard to work with the derivative of this objective function. Uh, and so uh, we will resort to the uh, uh, derivative-free method, and in particular, uh, uh, it's going to be a Brandt method with bounds. Uh, the implementation in, in SciPy is uh, uh, called minimize scalar. Well, scalar applies to all uh, one-dimensional functions, and this is what we are working with here. And we have to say method equals bounded to select this this Brandt method. Uh, you know, all of this um, information comes from the documentation uh, on on the uh, uh, SciPy optimization, and you can see here there is a pretty nice layout of methods that are available uh, in uh, in SciPy. Uh, unconstrained optimization, constraint, uh, it's all minimization, so mm, we'll have to remember to flip the sign. Global methods, uh, least squares minimization um, uh, for curve fitting. We've used this already. Um, uh, then univariate functions, and this this uh, this is the simplest case that we're using here. Okay, going back to the uh, to the example. Uh, so here's the uh, uh, here's a separate co code which uh, implements the class cake continuous, and this is a cake eating problem with uh, uh, more or less the same parameters that we had before. Um, when we looked at the cake eating problem, and um, I'm really only interested in uh, let let me switch to the notebook view. You can see that the methods uh, in this class are the Bellman equation itself, then the solver, and this is a VFI solver. You can see it uh, from uh, observing that this basically iterates on the application of the Bellman equation. And then there is a plotting function that visualizes the solution. Um, but let's look at the, uh, at the structure of the Bellman equation, which is the point here. So you can see that Bellman equation here involves two uh, nested functions, right? This is something that we can do in Python. The uh, functions are nested within other functions. Uh, and these are going to be some helping functions in uh, in particular, you know, find C solves for the optimal consumption for the given size, cake size M, and the value function VF. Um, so, because we have to solve the optimization problem in every point of the state space, then it makes sense to have this uh, uh, delegated to a separate function. Uh, right? And then the main body of the Bellman uh, is here. What do we do? Well, the main part is right here. We loop over all points in the state space, uh, which is given by self and grid. Uh, oh, this is the number of points, which is given by self grid state uh, of i. This is the point of the state space, the, the cake size. Uh, and then we call this find c with a particular size of the cake. And then uh, the function to... Um, to optimize and then this in interfunc. Interfunc now, this is the interpolation function which allows us to interpolate the value function in the next uh, time period and Bellman of course uh, operates on, on, on the given uh, value function. So okay, let's go uh, slowly uh, in, in order. 
So Bellman gives, uh, receives an, as an input argument the value function, uh, then creates the interpolation function that uh, allows us to compute this value at any point, uh, then allocates some space for the optimal policy to be calculated for each point, uh, um, for each point of the state space, as we said before. So it's going to have the same number of points and as the number of grid points in the state space. Now there is this uh, uh, particular uh, detail here that in the first point of the state space where the size of the cake is zero, then uh, uh, there is no problem to be solved really. I mean, if we have to choose between zero and zero, we could as well choose one half or we could choose, you know, the, 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 the size of the cake that is available, which is zero. Uh, uh, in this first point, and we don't really need to invoke the solver there. But in all points starting from the first one and all the way to the number of points on the grid uh, space, we find the optimal consumption here uh, in this loop. Okay, let's look uh, how this uh, uh, numerical solution works. Well, first we set some options for the method that we are using. And the options involves the maximum number of iterations and the uh, tolerance level. And these are passed or stored in the, uh, uh, in the objectives of the, uh, of the class, uh, max eater Bellman and tolerance Bellman. So we have additional technical parameters here for this solver. Um, and this, the choice of this is, a, is, an additional, is an additional question, right? And we could choose them uh, well or not so, uh, or not so well. Uh, this choice will uh, obviously affect the accuracy of the solution. Okay, and then we are calling the minimize scalar. This is the function that we've imported from SciPy Optimize uh, with the objective maximand, and that's given by yet another uh, nested function of Bellman. Uh, the args is the additional... Actually, let me uh, look at the documentation here. Uh, SciPy minimize scalar there. So what are the arguments here? Um, uh, the function is the callable objective function. Brackets uh, are used if the method is uh, Brent or Golden. Oh, I'm not using Brent, it seems here. Uh, um, I'm using the bounded. Um, so then the bounds must be mandatory. Uh, args is, are the extra arguments passed to the objective function. And so this args, uh, this args here, these are the additional arguments that need to be passed to the maximum to, for it to work, to the objective function for it to work. So the first argument is the variable with respect to which we optimize, okay, minimize in this case. But these additional arguments are additional arguments and they are the actual point, uh, uh, the size of the cake where we're solving this for, and then the interpolation function that allows us to compute the value uh, of the next period, right, the, uh, this, the second part of the Bellman equation. Okay, and then, okay, method is actually bounded, not burnt. Uh, and then the bounds are naturally the very small number epsilon and m, which is the upper bound for the choice. Uh, and I'm also giving it options, which as we saw, uh, sets the maximum number of iteration and the tolerance. Okay, and the maximum uh, is calculated as the maximum of the Bellman equation uh, over here, right? The utility plus beta uh, uh, v. Um, so the maximum is what we uh, calculated as a matrix in order to then take the maximum over one of the axes. But now this is just a separate function. Uh, we need to interpolate the value function uh, at the point given by m minus c at the point of next period's uh, size of the cake. And then this is our utility function log of c and then self beta times v next. Uh, gives us the uh, value of the maximum in the uh, in the uh, Bellman equation. Now we need to negate it because of the minimization, right? So this is the objective function uh, that is being minimized by this by this function, and then it rests uh, is uh, is uh, um, um, I think it's it's an object which has several attributes. In particular, it can be success and then rests x 
uh, contains the answer, the optimal uh, choice of consumption uh, uh, for that case. But if it's not a success, then uh, just to visually see uh, any problems that we may encounter, let's just say that then uh, we want to consume half of the cake that we uh, had and then it will be very easy to spot uh, on the resulting graphs if we uh, have any problem here. Okay, so uh, after this loop is done, then the optimal size of the cake is found for every possible uh, size of the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, optimal consumption is found for every possible size of the cake. And then what's left to do is to calculate the value resulting from this policy, resulting from this uh, decisions uh, of how much to consume. And then we can just plug the function that we found back into this maximant function, right? Because we found the maximum, then uh, this maximum disappears here and the value just becomes the what's, what's inside. Uh, and this, this is what happens in this line here. And again, we don't forget the minus because the objective was uh, negated due to the minimization. Okay, that's, that's all there is to this Bellman equation. And as you can see, now we've never discretized the choice space. So we never discretized consumption, uh, which prevented us from uh, vectorizing this whole operation. And now we have to do it point by point by looking at all possible sizes of the cake, all possible points in the state space uh, and maximizing the, uh, uh, the, the objective or minimizing the objective. Uh, um, uh, in each of these points. Okay, let's see how it works. Here is, we are setting the problem with, um, uh, with what, beta point 92, 10 being the upper bound, um, and 10 grid points. Okay, uh, it actually prints the, no the iteration that it works on uh, when we say so uh, solve plot and the reason for it is quite obvious. It takes time. I mean, if if these numbers didn't appear on the screen, then we would be wondering what's going on. Now, if you remember, the solution to the cake eating problem is a, is a linear consumption function that starts at the origin and has a particular slope. Uh, you can see here that we've converged in 153 iterations. Now, uh, with 10 grid points, uh, you know, this, they are quite visible on the on the value function. And also you can see that this consumption function is, um, uh, uh, you know, a little bit too conservative in the beginning. So for small cakes, we should have consumed more, right? And that translates for the whole consumption function being a little bit less, a little bit below than uh, what it should be. Um, here we can increase the number of grid points, but then I also, I also decreased the tolerance on the Bellman solver uh, because, you know, it does take time uh, to, to build this solution. We need 153 uh, iterations to converge. And then uh, for each of those iterations, there are now 100 points uh, and, and 100 optimization problems that are solved. So 15,000 uh, plus optimization problems that we need to solve in order to, to solve this problem. But look at this. It, the solution is, is a lot more like a linear function starting at the origin uh, for the policy function. And the, and the value function uh, also looks a lot like the analytical solution um, uh, that we that we looked at um, that we looked at in video thirty and and thirty two. Um, all right. So what are the conclusions? Um, well, the, dealing with continuous choice directly using numerical application uh, optimization definitely increases the precision of the solution, but it also is very much much slower uh, than the discretized uh, version of the solver that, that we had before. Uh, so um, uh, that's the reality. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, in the next practical video, we will implement this solution for the consumption savings uh, problem with uh, uh, stochastic incomes. Uh, but as a preview, I can say that, uh, you know, there, uh, uh, there are the, the, the other methods that we, uh, uh, that we listed in the previous video uh, actually d deliver similar accuracy or even high accuracy for uh, a slower or for a shorter running time. 
So it's not all lost yet. Okay, see you next time.